Switching it back over to uh, China, you mentioned in your book, or you make the case that we're already in the midst of a Cold War with China. What do you mean by that, and how deep do you think we are into that Cold War? So, you know, I, I've been convinced that we're in a Cold War with China for quite some time. But when I sat down to write this book, and there's quite a bit of history in this book about the first Cold War, even I was struck by the similarities between the two conflicts, because my assumption going in has always been it's a Cold War, but it's very, very different from the first Cold War, in part because of the economic integration between China and the United States. And doing the deep uh, research on the first Cold War, it was striking to me how uh, you had so much economic integration, even with Soviet Union, throughout the first Cold War that I think many people do not appreciate. But let me just run you through a few similarities. So first of all, and this is obvious to anyone just looking at the surface of this issue, you have a global competition for supremacy that is playing out between the United States and China in every corner of the world, not just in the Asia Pacific, uh, but in Europe, in Latin America, in Africa, uh, you name it, right? And it's playing out in the military sphere, in the economic sphere, in the trade sphere, in the technology sphere, in the diplomatic sphere, in every single uh, way, similar to the confrontation that we had with the Soviet Union for much of the Cold War. Secondly, you have an arms race. Both countries are building up their arsenals for this fight, preparing for this conflict. You know, I just met with Admiral Papara, who's the head of Indopaycom recently, and uh, you know, he, his command in Hawaii is preparing for war, right? It, it, it is absolutely striking. Even though most Americans are not thinking about war with China, the military and particularly folks in Indopaycom absolutely are. And what's interesting is that the arms race is not just conventional, but it's also nuclear. Um, the Chinese in particular have uh, struck um, uh, this path on a huge buildup of their nuclear arsenal. So for many, many decades since they became really a nuclear power, they've had about a steady number of 300 nuclear warheads. They're now building it up massively, both uh, the warheads themselves as, that, as well as additional missile silos. And uh, they're trying to get by U.S. intelligence community estimates to over 1,000 by the end of the decade and potentially match America around 1,500 warheads by the mid-2030s. Uh, uh, you have a space race, right? One of the defining characteristics of the first Cold War was the race to the moon in the 1960s, yep. which we, of course, won. Guess what we're doing now? We're trying to get back to the moon before the Chinese do and then on to Mars. Uh, remarkably similar. Uh, you have economic warfare in terms of tariffs that President Trump first instituted, Biden continued <clears throat> and increased. Uh, and and uh, uh, our allies is, are increasingly joining in on that with the Europeans instituting tariffs on electric vehicles from China. You have an ideological struggle. There it's a little bit different from the first Cold War because I think it's less about communism versus capitalism because both countries really arguably are um, variants of uh, capitalism uh, or even uh, – uh, you know, the, the the types of ideological struggles that were playing out in the first Cold War, but but it's certainly authoritarians versus democracy. And it's not an accident that she is cozying up to dictators like Putin and even uh, Orban, the most authoritarian leader in Europe, uh, and, and trying to reinforce that alliance. Uh, and he's exporting that ideology as well. Uh, so the Chinese have opened up in recent years schools in Africa to train future African leaders in surveillance technology, population control technology, uh, to help institute those authoritarian uh, uh, dictatorships. Not necessarily communist dictatorships in, in, in the traditional sense of the word, uh, but because they, they're less, they care less about the specific ideological alignment, but certainly dictatorial authoritarian regimes. You have a major regional flashpoint. So I argue in the book that Taiwan is really the new West Berlin. And a lot of people remember the Cuban Missile Crisis as sort of the defining most dangerous moment of the Cold War. Yep. And it certainly was that, but people have forgotten that there was another moment that was just as dangerous and was actually even longer in scope, and that was the West Berlin Crisis. Uh, it started uh, right after World War II with the confrontation between the Soviets and, and the Americans and the Berlin airlift that Truman instituted in 1948, but it continued through 1961 and the summer of 1961 was an incredibly dangerous period, right? So the Cuban Missile Crisis was 13 days in October of 1962. Uh, half of that time, Americans didn't even know it was happening until Kennedy announced it to the world. But in 1961, uh, the year begins with the Kennedy inauguration, the Bay of Pigs disaster, and Kennedy really wanting a better relationship with the Soviet Union, wanting a detente. He writes letter uh, to Khrushchev um, to ask for a summit. They have that summit in Vienna. 
in June of 1961. And Kennedy comes in with this agenda of we should not be in this uh, ideological confrontation. Let's find you know, a reasonable um, way to accommodate each other's interests. And Khrushchev wants none of it. And he, he's got one priority and one priority only, which is to kick America out of West Berlin and, and, and its allies. And it, he gives an ultimatum to Kennedy that unless you leave, I'm going to invade. And Kennedy is shocked. He leaves the summit completely shaken up, thinks that Khrushchev is a madman, and he goes on American television and announces to the country that we're going to be preparing for war. And he articulates that we're going to defend West Berlin, even though it's this tiny enclave of freedom uh, surrounded by East Germany, very, very difficult to defend, but we're going to defend it to the end, including risking nuclear confrontation. In fact, he announces to the public to prepare for nuclear war. He asks Congress to allocate money to identify fallout shelters across the country. I mean, just remarkable, um, scary times, right? And it went on for weeks and weeks throughout the whole summer. And in mid-August, Kennedy's woken up one day and he's told that the East Germans have started building the wall, obviously on behalf of the, of the Soviets. And you know what he says? He says, thank God. Remarkable response, right? Because 25 years later, you have President Kennedy saying, Mr. Gorbachev, take down this wall. But Kennedy celebrates it, and he says, you know, it's not a great solution, but it's better than war. And uh, uh, if he is building the wall, Khrushchev, then he's not invading. And ironically, that wall stabilized the conflict and allowed us to get to detente in the 1970s and arms control agreements under Nixon and Ford and so forth, because it signifies the end of Soviet expansionism, that they have basically agreed that they would control East um, Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, but they would no longer try to attempt to conquer by force Western Europe. And, and the Berlin Wall was kind of that, um, that border um, that was built both in a physical sense and, and in a symbolic sense. And Taiwan is really that crisis right now, right? And if we could build, obviously, a metaphorical wall across the Taiwan Strait and prevent an invasion uh, of Taiwan by China, then we could actually stabilize the Cold War. It wouldn't end. We still have this global competition for supremacy that plays out in every corner of the world. But Taiwan is really that one place where we might go to war with China over because of, of the critical um, reasons uh, why Taiwan is important to us. There's no other place where we would confront China. Just like in the f our first Cold War, there was really no prospect that we would fight the Soviets over anything other than Berlin and, and Cuba briefly, mm -hmm. right? We wouldn't fight them in Vietnam. We wouldn't fight them in, in Korea. Um, they didn't. They certainly had no no appetite for that. Um, or really, uh, you know, when they invaded Afghanistan, we weren't going to fight them for that. Uh, but Berlin was essential. Uh, Kennedy believed, and Truman and Eisenhower, uh, for U.S. credibility, for U.S. projection of power in in Europe. And Taiwan is that today. And we're not going to fight China for some rocks in South China Sea that are disputed or East China Sea. Taiwan is really that one place where you could go to war. And it's an incredibly dangerous period. So for all those reasons, the two conflicts are remarkably similar. And the one reason that people give for why this is not a Cold War is this economic trade that is uh, enormous between the United States and China. And as I write in the book, we actually had a lot of economic connections to the Soviet Union. I'll just give you a few examples. You may remember during much of the Cold War, you had these black Volga limousines that the Soviet leaders would drive through Red Square during their uh, parades. Those came out of a factory that was built by who? Drum roll, Henry Ford. They came over to the Soviet <laughs> Union uh, and built a factory to first produce tractors that was later converted to an automobile factory, later nationalized. Uh, if you're following the Ukraine war closely, you may remember that in the spring of 2022, there was this big fight in the city of Mariupol that the, the Russians were conquering, and the Ukrainian defenders were holed up in this massive steel factory called Azovstal in Ukraine, one of the largest in the world, and, and they um, held out there for many, many weeks before they surrendered. Well, that factory is an exact copy of a factory in Gary, Indiana, which at the time was the largest in the world, and American industrials came over to the Soviet Union to help build a steel factory for Stalin, because why wouldn't you want Stalin to produce steel so you can build tanks and aircraft and uh, ships and, and the like? Uh, so incredible uh, myopic uh, decision making uh, early, in the early stages of the Cold War, we were enabling the Soviet Union, literally arming them. Uh, there's another an incredible story where in 1946 and 47, this is after the Churchill speech in uh, Fulton, Missouri, where he has declared an Iron Curtain falling across Eastern Europe. Uh, 
uh, after the National Security Act of 1947 that established the CIA, and we're fully in the midst of a Cold War. Everyone knows this. And the Soviets are trying to produce their first jet fighter, the MiG-15. And uh, the trade minister, uh, who happens to be the brother of the uh, Mikoyan, the constructor of the, of the MiG, goes to Stalin and says, we're having trouble with the engines, the reliability of the engines. We've taken all these designs from Germany after World War II, but we can't quite get the reliability right. And we would like your permission to approach the British to see if they would sell us the Rolls-Royce engines. And Stalin is incredulous. He's like, which fool is going to sell you their secrets? But, you know, <laughs> no harm in trying. Give it a shot. They, they approach the British. And the British, the Labour Party that, that has just won the election there after World War II, is happy to sell them the Rolls-Royce engines. They get quickly reverse engineered, incorporated in the MiG-15s. Uh, and three years later, those MiG-15s shoot down 139 Americans over the skies of Korea. Right? Remarkably myopic decision making. And even throughout 60s and 70s, much of the oil and gas technology of the Soviet Union, which of course is financing the regime, financing the arms race, financing the space race, is running off Western technology that is sold to them, not even stolen. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, President Reagan in particular in the 1980s is trying to stop Wall Street banks and other banks in Western Europe from giving loans to Warsaw Pact countries, which were essential for sustaining their economies. Uh, unsuccessfully, by the way. So uh, this is remarkable. The scale is very, very different. Obviously, the, the relationship with China is unprecedented in history in terms of overall ec economic uh, trade uh, between two countries. But uh, it's changing now, and there's decoupling that's taking place in select industries like semiconductors, uh, EVs, batteries, et cetera, and a rebalancing that's occurring. So for all those reasons, I believe we're in a Cold War.